Hey, yo, make sure y'all check out that new series, Iraq and Elmira, three parts. You heard by the bro Saquon. If you ain't see that, you lacking. That's on the new and recent episodes only playlist, as well as the all Saquon playlist and the New York State Prison is Different playlist. You heard? Make sure y'all go check that because it's a whole movie and that's a fact. Z-Lord. Hey yo man, the real story of St. Laz coming soon, kids with guns. This is a documentary about growing up in the 80s and the early 90s in one of the most violent communities in the United States of America, Brownsville, Brooklyn. The most housing projects in the United States and the highest crime area in New York City. And that's a fact, you heard? The real story is coming, so forgive and pray for these dudes that's out there, you know, confused fans, angry and frustrated because they can't do what I'm doing, man. You feel what I'm saying? I understand, my brothers. I understand. I know I took over the YouTube streets. I know you can't go nowhere without hearing that name, St. Laz. I know you can't get me off your mind. I know you'll be all right. was again? This is 
the dumb shit that was unnecessary. Kep was there. Kep there, me and Kep got to go in the yard and wound up beating him up. And then T-Tom wound up stomping his other man out in the yard. We all go to keep black cages. So they keep black cages, like they put you in lower F or F block, whatever that shit was over there. And you go to the cages one a day, we go to the cages. It's a battle world, we get it on in the cages all over again. And you know, they don't care. They leave you in there till you fight till you get tired. They don't give a fuck. Once we're done, and they just give up when somebody gets stomped out crazy, and they come in, break it up. It was no mace, no none of that shit. But they said, when they said break, you break, or they gonna come in there and break you up. It was a racist motherfucker named Hobart, and motherfucker named Carol. Like, it was killing people in there. And, um, it's 30 days in there. We ain't even, you ain't even get tickets or writers for fighting in the cage. Like, that shit was legal or some shit. I went back to um, the same company I came from. Big Gears from Staten Island was there. You have one minute left. That's from 40 Projects was there. You said who from 40 Projects? Um, Big S. He was related to a dude named Dag Sean Burke from 40 Projects Queens. And then you had S1 from 140th and Manhattan. So, you know, everything I'm thinking is calm is cool because I lose that shit down because all the cuts and stabbings. And then when I go to the motherfucking vessel, a dude come behind me, stab me in the back of my head with an ink pit. Police tackle him down, wrestle him down. They slam me against the wall like I did something wrong. So, you know, they, they put me in um, E block. Took him, I think, F block, or straight to the box or some shit. And who was that dude? Why he, why he did that? Because he was on the opposite team, but I ain't have nothing to really do with that shit. That's like I walked into a bunch of beef. I had nothing to do with it, but just because I was with these dudes, they thought I had something to do with it. I get, I get off key. Like, Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. It will be recorded and may be monitored for law enforcement purposes. If you are an attorney, please hang up and follow facility instructions to register this number as a private number by going to www.nyc.g. O V slash D O C. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So now tomorrow we're gonna start it off with how that Kaksaki beef dragged off for three years through five other max A jails. I'm gonna give you all the details. Yo, but what happened after he stabbed you in the head with the pen? The pen. After he stabbed me with the pen, they put me in E block. They took him to the box. They tried to call me to the hearing. I refused to go to the hearing. So they gave me a ticket for fighting. They gave him a ticket for assault and fighting. He went to South Court. And he had spread the rumor saying, yo, shots told, shots told. So dudes told him, you know, send the paperwork, send the paperwork. You never send the paperwork. He put a foil in. And yo, Gilmore, he went and got the foil. The show that I refused to go to the hearing. So now they lost. A lot of people on their team spreading that full shit. And they got other people involved because they didn't like people spreading that full shit. So now when I come out, I go back to the same company, but it's one of his mans there. Dude named Hump. So the phone and my boy Tone, they gave me the rug cutter. I don't know why I suddenly thought it was a game. Like he turned his back on me like I wasn't including that just because he was a big brolic dude. I think it was super brolic. I walked behind him and I blew his shit off. I cut him from like the tip of his mouth all the way to the back of his neck. Passed the burn to young blood. Young blood took the burn away the cell. Man, his son started getting it on. Boom. Everything was cool until police came and they seen us fighting whenever they knock us down. When everything's all said and done, Gilmore, you know, Gilmore didn't give a fuck, but Pearson was trying to write it up. Gilmore told him I had nothing to do with it. So that night, I made it to the yard. I get to the yard, dude named Lele from Queens, Blue Ridge, from the Bronx, head off for the jump start. It was all over and on again in the yard. And then London tried to cut me, and this was my man from adolescence. I didn't even have beef with him, but that was his man. So me and him started getting on. And then they dragged me in, and that's when the other dude, Pearson, was like, he was just had a fight on a cup, and he ain't supposed to be in the yard. And he took me to the box. And from there, I went straight to Southport. And from Southport, it was the most disgusting part of my bed where this every CO there had Ghostbuster suits on with galoshes and gas masks. Cause it was shit.
shit wars. Like people couldn't get to you, so people would throw shit at you. Dudes, you know, she, Sister Josepha was in a chair. She was a nut. They shit her out of chair. The Imam, good brother, man. He was, he was, Imam Elaji. They shit his kufi off his head. The superintendent was so gangster. They shit him down. He was saving the bill for his suit. Come back in a sweatsuit two days later and shit you down back. Like this shit was, it was, it was pure savage. You said the police was shitting niggas down? The superintendent, motherfucker shit the superintendent down. He seen with a bill for his suit, come back a day or two later with a sweatsuit on, and shit you down back. <laughs> and, you know, this shit was so savagery, man. I'm talking about, these dudes, I seen dudes put shit in their mouth and spit it at you. Dudes that fill up a toothpaste tool, bring it to the yard, and stomp it. That shit be like a shotgun and splash you. So you be in the yard for the whole hour with bright sun smelling like shit. Yo, this shit was, yo, this shit was pure savagery. It was like the, the, the surveillance, it was no mercy. They didn't care who it was. One dude named John Son, he should have do mama down on the visit. So they start getting busy on the visit. This shit was crazy because you were in cages in the visit. So it'd be like 10 out of the cage, you got people on the other side of the cage. And dude, that dude shitting him down, he shit his mama down, and then they start fighting. Mm -hmm. So it was nothing but shit war. That's where, when I got there, that's when I met K.O. Smitty. He was doing long trips out of the box. That's when I met Blue Boy of Louis Rosado. He was doing long time in the box. That's when I met Skip, Eric Thomas. He was doing long time in the box. That's when I met a lot of old timers, and I really started reading books. Like Skip started giving me George Jackson. And, you know, sold that brother and blood in my eye the side of Shakur. And then K.O. Smitty, he started working on my footwork more. Uh, shadow box, work on the baseball, give me tips on my combat skills. Blue Boy, he had so many books on strategy from, from, it was books like The Art of the War, The Cold of Magnavilla, The Prince. All his books was on strategy and war. He just flooded me with them and would quiz me on them to make sure I read them. So this is my circle because I was out when I was in that box and I did almost two years there for a cutting. And it, 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 this shit was ridiculous. And in, in there, they you was, have one minute left. It was four men cages at first. And you know, the last dude in the cage get the cuffs off first. So dudes get the cuff off first. He started chopping everything in the cage, so it was dangerous. One dude act like he's trying to start a sneaker just so you can go in front of him so he can get in that last and get his burner out first and get the handcuffs off first. And, you know, it, it, was, it was real, real bad. Like a dude named Pablo Sasa, he called a kid named J-Rock, a rapper named J-Rock like that. Got that, she got the cuffs off first and twisted J-Rock in the cages. And, like, I dance, that's when they started the single man cages. And the single man cages in the South Line just made the shit wars turn up even more. And it's small. I'm gonna get deeper into the shit wars when I call you, baby. Sound for how that shit was pure savagery and heartbreaking. And at two months after I was the box, I still smelled shit. Like, I, that shit was like permanently in my membrane this night. That shit, I couldn't get rid of it. I smelled shit everywhere. I was like, to Thank you for using Securus. Goodbye. LAZ man you heard check my track record I got songs and videos with rap legends too many to name you heard put my name in on any mixtape website st.laz and you gonna see heavy results so if you want to collab with the guard hit me up on Instagram real St. Laz you heard I had that guap Make sure you go check that series me and the bro Saquon just did. Iraq and Elmira is three parts to that. It's epic. Make sure you check it. You heard go on that new and recent episodes only playlist or go to that all Saquon playlist or that New York State Prison playlist. You heard. And um, make sure you leave a comment. Rep that comment gang, that Slim Blunt gang, that Gen Pop fam, whatever it is you represent out there. You heard. Holla at me, Z Lord. It's a lot of stories on the channel, man, that y'all dudes gotta check out. You heard? A lot of stories. Check that new general joint. 
that beef with Philly Muslims and the feds, you heard, that's a federal penitentiary story. John Ryder told a story from his perspective early months ago on the channel. And now you're hearing that story from the horse's mouth. Make sure you go check that. That's on the page. Go to that new and recent episodes only playlist and you're going to find it. Z-Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man. Holla at me. He was in Lewis Hibbers about uh, five, six years later being found innocent of a drug charge. Of his rape case by Michael Conjure DNA. They found another dude's pubic hair in the chick's panties and matched it with a dude who they arrested and who finally confessed. The CEOs beat these dudes so bad, I see one year later in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down. I met the house unit and it had an upstairs and downstairs. And as people came out that night for galley recreation where we could use the phones and call our people collecting. No more free calls or three ways. That shit was over. The phone could detect if you did three way calling, and the CEO he'd be notified. Once the phone in a bubble rung, you knew damn well you would not. And the CEO he'd look at you, signal you for the hang up. Next day you get a misbehave report. You eventually get a hearing in front of a racist lieutenant who's not trying to hear nothing you say. They take five dollars out your account for the ticket and give you thirty days keep back with your cell confinement, where you be in your cell 23 hours a day with one hour recreation, and your clothes and boots were so cheap, you freeze in the summer. He shit was everywhere, so when going out, everyone looked up to see and make sure none of them flew over you. The last meal of the day, one dude got a nasty hit, like this bird was sick or something, because, yo, know, it, 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 it smacked on his bald head with a loud slap drip down his face like dark green and bright white snot. For the guys who wreck shit recreation that night, everyone came out of themselves in folders full of papers and paperwork. So, you know, I asked the guy, yo, what's all that? He was like, yo, um, everybody brings out their rap sheet. So your pillowcase with the rule book. I'm like, what? He's like, yo, yeah, bring it out so everybody know who's a rainbow, who's a rat, who's a chaplain, who whatever. I was like, all right, so I ran back to my cell to get mine, which was one page, not even the full page. It was manslaughter in the first degree, and the attempt murder from Swarfit. You know, so um, I found my name to use the phone, then sat down at a table in front of a Spanish guy named Negro from Washington Heights. He asked me to play chess, so we set up a game, started a small talk, trying to guess which jail we go to from here. Then we heard a loud smack and a thump like a body hit the floor. I told him, look, the nigga grabbed my shoulder and he was like, yo, we mind our business at the time. You know, if it ain't got nothing to do with you, you won't even look that way. He said, son's a rainbow, so he gets the swallow. I'm like, the fuck is a swallow? He's like, the, 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 the deodorant bottle you got, they knock you out, pull your pants down, put it in the crack of your ass and kick it up in your ass. Well, it tears the dude up real bad. I heard about this shit being done on the alley, but I never saw it. I still didn't. I just heard the scream when he kicked him in his ass and the police pulled him along. Nego grabbed me and said, yo, hit your cell quick. I ran up to my cell, looked out, and Swarm Seals rushed in with sticks and black gloves, big fat rednecks that all smell like old green baloney. Homeboy immediately told when they were putting him on a stretcher with his ass up in the air. The seals took four dudes out. I heard they all got arrested for sodomy, so they called a sex case for punishing a dude for having a sex case sex case. And the sad part is, even though this dude read it, he was in newspapers about five, six years later, being found innocent of his rape case by Michael Conjure DNA. They found another dude's pubic hair in the chick's panties and matched it with a dude who they arrested and who finally confessed. The CEOs beat these dudes so bad, I see one year later in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down. One died from hematoma, a blood clot and brain fall, being beat upside the head with the sticks, and not one CEO got arrested or even suspended. What, CO beat the dudes up? Day. They beat the dudes up that swathed them? Yeah, beat the shit out of them. And then came to work the next day like it was just another day on the job. Like, 
it was just regular shit. Nobody got suspended, got arrested, nothing. And one of these dudes died. Yo, we got cheap ass jackets with cheap green winter hats. That, you know, the, 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 the hats are so cheap. If you slept in it and stressed out so bad, you had to tie the knot to wear skin so it would fit. <laughs> we all have bald heads, so we all slept with our hats on. I slept with my boots on, too. I ain't gonna fuss. And my body became extremely sensitive to everything. If the CO's shadow passed over me in my sleep, I woke, it woke me up. I developed primary insomnia, but when my body did crash, the slightest anything woke me up, and I would be instantly alert and ready to defend my life. Tickets were still being sold in commissary and now even for adolescents on heroin, but I never smoked. I used my one-arm recreation to hit the heavy bag in the gym with Negro. I called my grandmother every night for six minutes, which was all the time there now. And it was collect, and they recorded. They recorded all the calls. So my grandmother, the Honorable Miss Mary Bennett, she's the strongest woman, most loving woman I ever met. You know, I cried every, after every phone call, every visit with her. I miss her so much. You know, just think about it now, I think you want to tear up. I was raised by her, you know, with morals and manners and principles. She was from Swainsboro, Georgia, and had my back no matter what I did or faced. This woman was there. She loved unconditionally, and I cry when I think about her to this day, like, because I feel like I let her down by not enjoying life, by wasting so much time in the cage. Like, I had a wasted life. Like, I went from being so happy, having fun, going to school, riding bikes, amazing home-cooked meals every night, not ordering breakfast every morning to a world of extreme violence, mental anguish, pain and suffering, loss, heartbreak, betrayal, and abandonment. Nani, my girlfriend, she disappeared as soon as I left C-74. I got no more mail. Only pictures from grandma. Like I had no one else to call but grandma. No one else took my collect calls but grandma. And only grandma brought my little girl to come see me. My mom was out at home, but still, and recovery and going through physical therapy. I had no great brother to call on anymore. No one I could say, yo, I got beef, come help me. I had to find my own way and man up. I had to represent or be victimized. You know, both though, Junie and Troy Black finally contacted me. Junie, you know, AKA David Vaughn, and Troy Black, AKA Troy Simmons, they lived in my building, 545. We grew up together, and together, these three took care of my grandmother. My baby brother Elgin and made sure I wanted for nothing when I was in there. When I got the letter from Johnny with pictures of him, Bondo and Trey Black, I didn't worry about my grandmother or my mom or my little brother anymore. Three of my day ones stepped up to help my family. Now, through this whole time of loss and of death, for them to step up, uh, I love them brothers to this day. And you know, I'm, I'm in touch with Johnny right now. I don't know, I heard Bondo got deported. Troy Black, I think, still lives in the building, but we haven't been in touch in years. But anyway, I got into my workout more, started jogging five miles a day, hit the heavy bag in the gym on a regular, started hitting weights with only deadlifts and snatches until I could deadlift 500 pounds and do one off snatches with the 100 pound dumbbells with boot strength, and I was gonna need it. Because three minutes later, I was told to pack up and send the CAC SAC correction facility, and it was more than raise the tag. Weapons were upgraded. A dude named Boogaloo just got murdered in the mess hall with a butcher knife over a pack of cigarettes. He only had like 30 days to go home. And everyone had big rectangular rug cutters to cut through your hoodies and towels and get your flesh. We just lined up in front of five big racist white guards and I heard every jail had a, a siege, you know, when you get there, so that you know they were not wholesome. But these guards are different. He's like, yo, this is CAC SAC rectal facility. You can cut each other, you can stab each other, you can kill each other. We don't give a fuck. But if you touch one of my officers, we're going to kill you. Now, take on out, my officers going to take you to your house. You know, and that was the end of that speech. The jail was still on lockdown because of the murder. So I spent the next seven days in my small cell. I was more like a cave, right? Not as the grandma, Johnny, Bone, Don't Troy Black. That know where I was. And and I called as soon as I came off lockdown. Went off lockdown, Puerto Rican field door from Grant pulled up in front of my cell. 
he and Rashid were both dope. So I'm brother Rashid, and I felt so good to finally see somebody that I knew. I still was as real as they came, all the way live and no nonsense. Next time, I'll fill you in on what happened in Cash Jackie. Hey yo, make sure y'all check that Marcy Memoirs playlist with all the episodes we did. We got major Marcy legends on the check-in on that, you heard? That's a fact. So make sure you check that playlist and make sure you don't miss no episodes, you heard? You can't be out here lacking, not knowing what's going on on these YouTube streets, you heard? Because we heavy on these YouTube streets, baby. We run these YouTube streets, that's why they mad. These other dudes, they mad, man. You heard? Make sure you check out that free Shot Shot playlist so you can see every episode we did. We putting in that work, man. We ain't playing no games. We putting down that real New York history. You heard that real Rikers Island State Penitentiary history. You feel what I'm saying? New York State Penitentiary history. We not, we not private investigators on this channel. We not news reporters. You heard we don't speak about open cases we don't speak about crimes that people are currently on the run for we don't do none of that you heard that's what these other dudes do i don't know you know it's a lot of drugs there's a lot of drugs in these streets nowadays but the biggest drug of all is youtube bro that's why my new motto is youtube is a hell of a drug youtube is a hallucinogenic you heard? Because it make these dudes do the stupidest things in the world for some views. Yo, I'm in South Four Blocks, Pine City, New York. Only thing I can have is like cosmetics, legal work, reading books, the Bible, and the Quran. I'm on level one for 30 days. And I, I gag and choke every day because every day dudes do shit on each other. And the police, and the police, like nobody was safe. Like a dude named Chino Dirtball came out of his cell grabbed the bread bag off the windowsill at the corner left there this morning. Cause you know, that was his man, they lined it up. So when Chino came out for a shower, everyone came out cuffed up with police escort on on their arm. But Chino broke through, snatched the bread bag off the windowsill and slapped it against this dude named Scooty Cellgate and shit went everywhere. And I mean, not one spot in their cell didn't have shit dripping off it. Shit dripped from the ceiling. And, of course, the showers were over. Police took Chino dirt bomb to another block, and we were left to suffer all night until they took Scooty out and they hold the cell down. Dudes were behind plexiglass for throwing shit, and this didn't, yo, this didn't stop nothing. They put it in the shampoo bottle and stomp it while it was on the floor. When you walk by, they shit your feet down and ankles down. Police would escort us with. With us in the club, you know, with whoever was closest to the cell, put us close to the cell, so they wouldn't get shit thrown on them. Anyway, finally after like 30 days of savagery, I got to A block and next to a dude named Mitchell Harper, aka the omnipotent Bogart in like Brooklyn. Well, it's one of the realest live dudes I ever met in my life, man, from Brooklyn. By this time, he had like 12 years in on 25 life sentences. They sent me a kite by reaching over. You know, southpaw cells were designed so the dude on your left could reach out his feet up sliding and shoot you down, but you couldn't reach him and get him back because your feet up slap was on the right, like like his was. So people tend to get cool with the dude and locked on their left, but always kept their sheet tied up on the on the bars just in case. Anyway, he was like, young blood, you got a band here that poked you with an ink pen and cat sack and He's saying you told because you didn't go to the hearing to testify for him. And now I talk to your man, Boogie Blind, like he tell me talk to Boogie Blind. Now he told you, Boogie Blind told him I was stand up. The son poked you when you walked through the metal detector in front of the police who was searching people at the metal detector. So he said, you know, Boba said he knew it was bullshit. He said, but I got to stay off the gate. Don't open, don't open no doors that can't be shut peacefully. And just lay low until you catch up with something. He said, a lot of dudes here got beef, but you would never know till you buck because real warriors don't buck, don't don't buck their guns behind bars. 
they you know what I'm saying, they let their actions take form. So, so you know, I see you in the morning, young blood, in peace, and he signed that shit that I'm nipping in bulk on you. I like your son from the beginning. How he came at me was real shit. You know, I woke up early in the yard at 8 a.m. on level two that day, and this is when, you know, I met Boss, a.k.a. Andrew Bostic, a real gangster from Brooklyn. He just came from Clinton, where a dude shabbed him in his eyes. He ripped it out, and then they killed the dude with the same knife. His vision was still good, but he was cockeyed now. And he introduced me to Benny B, a.k.a. Benny B. Benitez. He been down since the 60s and was on death row back then for catching a body in jail. Blue Boy, K.O. Schmidt, he came outside. Next, then came, came our man Dude. Man Dude was a big six foot, six, 390 pound beast, but he was well read, steady. And if he said he was your comrade, he ride with you until his death against anybody. So, him and a dude named Crime started arguing in the yard. Crime called man do all kinds of faggots, bitches, told him a thousand ways he could suck his dick. And, and, and then, in mid-sentence, man do spit a big, massive, nasty-ass flip, getting Crime out. He almost threw up while we all gagged and laughed at the same time. This shit hit the back of his throat, yo. It was like Mandu was building up the whole time crime was mouthing off. Mandu went to the farmer's part of his cage, put his shirt over his head so crime couldn't spit in his dreads. And Mandu made jokes like, ah, man, I ain't brush my teeth in the morning, yo. I couldn't believe it. Baby B took a line to me. I started working out with him in bars every day. Started off with a thousand jump jacks, all in one clip, a thousand push ups, sets of 50, burpees, 10 sets of 20. After six months of this, you know, Blue Boy called one of his bandits, cut him in the clinic on a visit. I'm not sure which. I finally caught this dude who stabbed me going to the clinic. We were all handcuffed with like waist chains, so Southport was all about kickboxing. So most of us, you know, we had. We told the police and the nurses we had bad ankles, we needed ankle support to keep our boots. So the clinic would give us boot permit. So, you know, I act like I wasn't paying this dude no mind and was just going to peacefully walk by. Then I spent at the last minute and kicked him in his balls as hard as I could. I knew it was a good one because my foot hurt for days afterwards. He fell on the floor, started throwing up. I heard they took him to Wendy's where he was in like hospice and had to use a walker to walk around because his balls swelled up like balloons. But then I went through hell. I was putting an eight block next to a real shit that tried to extort me for candy bars because you got candy bars once you was on a certain level. And when I said no, I would just splash on my cell balls and I, I smelled it and carried up and put my sheets up on the bottom to the balls. That was, yo, like that was Turkey Island King, nigga. I was like, oh my God. That night, I tried to sneak and clean some of the shit up. And thinking that he was asleep, took the curtain down and splashed. I heard the shit again. He's like, that's beast cavatory, nigga. So I smashed the sheet back up. Like, yo, this nigga don't fucking sleep. Like, oh my God. Like, other dudes were like, yo, just get a dude with some candy balls, yo, so he can sign up and hear I was like, man, fuck him. I'm not giving him shit. Like, shut up, splash. That's yeah, he's sober, nigga. Like, every time we do something, he said, we got a different meal. Like, other dudes tried to give him candy, but he said, nah, he wanted for my tough ass. Police wouldn't even come on the company where shit was with greatness, so shower, it was no showers, no wreck, and they kept the windows closed, turned the heat up, open, we eventually give up because of the stench. I met Danny Rodriguez, he was there for a ride in Kaksaki, Kaksaki box, where they, they took over the box. A dude named Dice from Brooklyn, who became a transgender years later, changed his name to Lil' Kim. I saw my boy Nut from LG. Me and Danny worked out in our cells and gagged through every workout. That chicken child man, nigga, like he was just wilding on me every day. And then finally this dude fucked up and slashed the captain. The captain came back with his team, dragged his ass out, and whipped his ass all the way till he couldn't hear his screams no more. And next day, inmates from cash rate holds the whole gallery down while we went to wreck and yo, I don't care no matter what, I still smell shit. My next neighbor got off with that nigga candy bars, cakes, I don't give a fuck what it was, cigarettes, and anything he wanted, cause I could not go through that shit again. I was like, nigga, I don't want no beef. I had to get rid of legal work, boots, 
books, pictures, loved ones, clothes, love pictures of loved ones, clothes, almost everything because everything I had smelled like shit. No matter how many showers it took, I still felt dirty. I was, yo, I was not cutting my hair, but I washed like crazy. I had long braids down to my shoulders at this time. I seen my boy, Mama Dukes, AKA China. He just cut down from 140 for all the car stuff. He was just on the news like about a month ago recently. He just got killed in Queens. And like, for your rest in peace, my boy China, we got busy together on plenty of occasions. On my next bed, when I, when I caught 20 flight, but that's another story. I seen shop off from LG. He and my sister Tonya had a baby together. My nephew did call him. I didn't even know shop off, but I know who he was. We didn't kick it at him. We just go nod at each other whenever we pass each other in the yard and shit. We were mutual respect type shit. But I finally got on, got out the box, got sent to Attica. I make two commissary buys, four football games, and wind up getting handcuffed, shackled, and thrown down the stairs and beat dead men to death for hitting Hollywood with a hot cooking oil and cutting up pissy black with a can top. And I got back to Southport so quick, people didn't even know I left. They gave me an assault on staff when it was them who beat my ass and I was sent to deep block in Southport. You know, that's the boxy box where I met the next day to skip Eric Thomas. They call him AKA Frack Nick. You know, it's all. And he became my mentor throughout the years. He loaded me with books, worked out like Bob's and Benny B with a thousand and everything, and really smiled. I spent the next 12 and a half months with him. Andy Omaha, Blue Boy, Jack McQueen, both Skaggs from Brooklyn, till finally my, ne- my, my time was up to leave the box. And you know, I was a last shopper, more militant, and so grateful to get away from the shit walls and, and motherfucking South Boy. Like, I was in population, like I went from there to Auburn and it's like I was in population for two months and still smelled shit. I couldn't understand that shit. That shit that shit really bothered me. That shit really fucked my senses up. Like no matter how many showers I took, I done threw all clothes away, got new clothes and still smelled shit. Like <laughs> Southport was horrible and during that bed I went back to Southport like two more times, bro. That shit was real ridiculous, man. That shit horrible. The savagery that you suffer in there and like the police they promote that shit. They do shit to make y'all do shit to each other because you can't fight. Only you get somebody if they go to the clinic. But if you never come out of cell, it's like you got to throw something out. I've never threw feces or spit at nobody or threw piss on anybody. I, I just, I couldn't do it. I'm not playing with my shit. I'm not playing with no piss. I'm not spitting at you. I just wait till I catch you and then I tear a hole in your face or put holes in you. But I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that savage shit. I just can't do it. But this dude really put me through it. And I swore, yo, if I ever see him do it again, I would break him in half. But I, I ain't never catch up to him. But I do really torture me. It really fucked me up bad with that shit. And while I was in the box, you know, I, I lost more family members. You know, I lost, you know, my grandpa, my father's father. You know, that shit hurt me. You know, in there, you can't go to, they're not letting you go to wait the funeral. That shit hurt hard. You have one minute left. Comrade died. My boy Dusky died. You know, not my childhood friend was dying on me when I was in there. And I'm in the box. I'm getting this news and shit. That shit really, that shit really was fucking me up, man. Because these are dudes that I, I was planning on coming home and getting with and, and chilling with and having fun with and reminiscing with. You know, so we, we show each other pictures of our kids and shit. I'm getting news that these same dudes is dying on me, man. That shit. It was, it was a horrible, bad thing, man. Out of box, if you're an explanation, you got more time to think. And, the, and everything's so quiet, you hear the buzzing from the lights. So that shit is crazy. It'll drive you crazy if you're not mentally strong, man. Sensory deprivation is real in there. Now, every day, I'm gonna tell you about each jail I've been in, because it's like, and as I travel and go through it, what happened, what went down here. Like, the next spot, Auburn, we get to get into motherfuckers, get the out of five seconds, got his head chopped off. Newt caught the body from Jim. Mikey B, they, 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 you know, they put gasoline in themselves. They, when they took the body out, it just looked like a burnt beef stick. Nigga, like arm was melting to his body. Like, I'm gonna give the details of all the shit I seen in there. That shit was horrible in all burn. All burn was pure savage. That shit was living peace mode for real. Oh, when I went back to Southport, the shit was again. That shit was crazy. 
Who you said was the most wildish shit thrower when you was there? Nigga named John Stunt. John Stunt. Where he was from? I don't even know. He was a white boy. <laughs> he was a white dude? Oh, he shit a nigga mama down on the business. That shit, I was like, oh my God. Everybody wanted to kill him, man. Even the police. They had him, so they put him with nobody, no neighbors. They didn't give him no neighbors, so he couldn't shit his neighbors down. Crazy. He's one of them dudes, like, yeah, now I fucked up child molestation that case or whatever. So everybody hated him. So he just started to hate it back by just throwing shit on everybody. He didn't shit anything. Get on the company on him. He'd be scared to walk by. He shit you down. This is shit you down. They had glass on his bars. He shit your feet down under under the motherfucking door. Like he was just savage. Told you like two months after I was out the box, I was still smelling shit. I was like, what's the fuck, yo? I shit down. I shit getting a nigga. Shit getting a nigga. Pause. I was psycho over that shit. I, yo, I was like, yo, it's something wrong, dude. I got still smelling. Now you all the way down. And you know that 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 institutional shit smell is different. Like that that shit smell that's mis- mixed with the steel of the cells. Like a terrorizer. This nigga was like, that's beef cavatory. Like a chicken chow man. Nigga said, that's that Yakasoba. Nigga said, that's that Yakasoba. That nigga was, I said, oh my God. That nigga, you know, every time he slashed, he said a meal. Oh, shit, sure, fire right. I was like, oh my God. But you said he just was throwing it on your gate? Yeah. But it was getting, it gets through. Like, I never been to Southport. They just got a little hole, though, right? Yeah, that shit gets through your sheets. Even that shit soaks into your sheets and all anything. Nigga, it don't matter. That smell is like forever. That shit is your shit smell is different, man. That shit, whoa. That shit, it's nothing like changing a baby diaper, my nigga. This shit is like, yo, I ain't never, I don't never, yo. Every time I had a neighbor, yo, B, I don't want no beef. We need some cookies, cigarettes. I was buying, I didn't even smoke. I was buying cigarettes for these niggas so they wouldn't shit me down. Like, yo, B, I'm, yo, y'all good? <laughs> No more smoke. That shit did, man. I think it's really easy. I was terrified with that shit. That shit had me. Unbelievable. Yeah, that oh, shit is crazy, right? Especially now with, you know, COVID and all of this crazy oh, shit. Like, oh. That's a lawsuit, bro. Niggas shouldn't have been a sub- niggas shouldn't have been subjected to shit. Niggas throwing shit on nine. Niggas supposed that did something about that. Holy thing here, that nigga had the Ghostbusters, the big white Ghostbusters suits with the big galoshes and the goggles and gas masks. They was protected. They didn't give a fuck. <laughs> you said the niggas was coming through shit and niggas down back like niggas. That shit made everybody go crazy. Yo, the, the super antenna came through. Nigga with a sweatsuit. Nigga had a cart full of cups. We smoked the shit before it got to us. He stood in front of the cell and just, yo, he ain't miss a spot in this nigga's cell. He, you have one minute left. Said, oh my God, that shit was wow. And then they gave him a surcharge so he could pay for his suit. Uh, man. Nigga said he had a cart full of cups. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> nigga. I'll tell you what. Nigga, a lot of motherfuckers were there. Remember that shit like, yo, that was crazy. Like, yo, he didn't give a fuck. That shit is Hey yo, make sure y'all check those other Sha Sha episodes about Big. There's two episodes about Big being in C74. Back in the days in Mod 8, you heard exclusive B.I.G. Brooklyn, New York, Rikers Island history. You heard that's what we about, man. That's what we about, man. We put out that real history, bro. We ain't playing no games with these dudes out here. You feel what I'm saying? But yeah, man. Make sure you check that free shot shot playlist for all the episodes you heard. Yo, listen. This this album right here is on SoundCloud. You heard? It's called St. Laz and Chill. Like this joint right here. It ain't nothing but laid back chick joints. You heard? Cool out vibe. Cool vibe type joints. Like... It's one of my best albums. I put out a lot of albums, man. 
I was on the underground rap scene for a long time, putting out a lot of underrated fire. But check this album on SoundCloud, it's vicious. Think about this. What if your ad was right here, right now? The thousands of views you're going to see this video having in the next day or two, those thousands and thousands of people that watch this, they could have been watching you, your Instagram, your brand, your music, your video. So holla at me if you need that real promo. I'll get you seen by thousands of people. And that's a fact. I started getting panic attacks every time I stepped in the cell from wreck and the cell gate. Whenever the cell gate closed behind me, I felt like I had a heart attack. At first, I thought it was. I was having a heart attack. I told Blue, and he said, simply, yo, focus on, on your breathing. It's cage folks. The fuck is cage folks? He said, yo, we all get it. Some of us deal with it better than others. Just don't ever let this psych give you medication for nothing. So our people made it through this middle passage, so we can make it through anything. I had to look up what the hell the middle passage was. My co-defendant Sam, Alex McFadden, he was in Wendy's. We didn't see each other, but he worked in the laundry. So we sent kites back and forth. It was great just to know that he was out right, because the last we were together, he had blue trial for a body, he got like 27 life. Randy Love was there in Wendy's too. That's Randy Jameson from Harlem. And um, I ain't seen him since. He had Johnny and, and Donald and my boys in the closet, his husband for him on 28th Lennox. It was crazy back then, you know, that was the late 80s, and them was moving like a, two bricks a day on one block of crack. Crack was different then, that shit was like 12 to 15 dollars a gram. Anyway, they both sent me food and wrote, we wrote each other back and forth through the laundry until I, until I was transferred back to Southport. This trip to Southport box, this shit started to really get to me. I learned that true sensory, I've learned what true sensory deprivation was. The food was bland, and the light wasn't too bright, it was too dim, and it wasn't too hot, it was too cold. My old jail had H. pylori from the water. I had an asshole next to me who just kicked my wall all day long so I could only vibe with Blue Boys when this asshole was asleep. Blue taught me how to really get into books I read in make my mind escape jail. After reading all the books he had on strategies and war and history, we grabbed four books off the book carts that came around every week. And we picked any four, no matter what they were, and we wouldn't put them down until we finished them to you know, expand our knowledge. And um, the Blue always told me, if you limit your knowledge, you limit what you can accomplish. So if you don't know much, you never achieve much. I started getting panic attacks every time I stepped in the cell from wreck and in the cell gate. Whenever the cell gate closed behind me, I felt like I had a heart attack. At first, I thought it was. I was having a heart attack. I saw Blue, and he said, simply, yo, focus on, on your breathing. It's cage phobia. I'm like, the fuck is cage phobia? He said, yo, we all get it. And some of us deal with it better than others. Just don't ever let this psych give you medication for nothing. So our people made it through this middle passage, so we can make it through anything. I had to look up what the hell the middle passage was when he scored me on that, knowing I did that. The blue boy helped me through this box trip in more ways than one. He told me whenever I was about to man I'm out of angry letter, don't rip it up. It's your, it's your, it's, you know what I'm saying? Get it out your system first. Now write a good letter. Don't burn no bridges. I started sleeping only in the daytime because the asshole kicked my wall all night until he built up a sweat and went to sleep. Most people in Southport didn't belong in the box. They belong in mental institutions. There were still spit fights every day, kickboxing matches every day. A few dudes had cuff keys, came out the cuffs and tore a hole in their enemy faces. And this position, you know, you can even block because your hands will cuff and tend to your body by a waist chain. So when you got cut in Southport, you got cut good. And I mean real good. Only a few got away because their kickboxing game was up. Like a brother I met in Chicago. A dude came out to cuss on him. He kicked the dude's teeth out of his mouth. They kicked him out cold. It's the first time in my life I saw a man get kicked out with a kick to the face. It was beautiful. I mean, this shit was, Bruce Lee would have been proud, you know what I'm saying? The bug out next to me made 
what was called a silencer, a lubidone bottle filled with shit juice. And a, and, and a hole, he made a hole in it with a safe. So when you squeezed it, a small stream of shit juice squeezed out and it hit the CEO's pants leg a little bit, just enough so that he smelled like shit all day. And we'd be in tears while the CEO sniff around all day, wondering where the hell that smell was coming from. They did tell each other they smelled like shit, argue beef. One time, they kicked one CEO out the bubble because they said he stink like shit. One day, his asshole squeezed his cop, though, and they picked me as the culprit. Snatched me up, put me in D-block, the boxing box, put me on the low side. It was a big, hard-ass brown piece of bread with all kinds of stuff in it. I had five days and two, meaning I had to loaf for three times a day for five days and two days for a regular meal. And it seemed like the two days always fell on days when they had bullshit for meals, like a cup of tuna, nasty-ass egg salad or cold cuts or soggy-ass ravioli. The cell lights never cut off, so the buzzing was killing me. Yo, when it was quiet, the lights sound so loud, that shit was driving me crazy. The shower was always freezing. I learned to never complain, because they only make jokes and enjoy the fact that they knew they would make you a suffer and make you uncomfortable. So I couldn't tell. Snitching just wasn't at me, so I had to, I had to hold the shit down. I got an extra nine days in the box for unhygienic act when the dude squirted the cop. So after a month, CEOs was like, yo, tell me when you want the water warmed up or not, or how warm you want it. He said, I'm adjusting the water. I couldn't even understand. All the time I've been there taking the showers, never could be adjusting. The shit was cold. And then I could, I didn't know I could tell him to adjust the, cold, adjust the water. I'm like, you mean, if I ask you to adjust the temperature, you'll do it? I was shocked. He's like, yeah. Don't tell me you've been down here taking cold ass showers, yeah? I said, yeah. I thought y'all was just being assholes for the 90 days. I was taking freezing mountain cold water showers and shit. He was like, nah, soldier, we ain't all that bad. We started small talk about how he was in service the Marine and being from upstate York. It's the only job he could find not, not far from where he lived. He just paid the bills. The time of deep block, I didn't know nobody at all. and didn't talk to no one either. The noise from the light in my cell was driving me crazy. Sink dripped and drop. That drip drop sound, that shit drove me crazy. I counted the books on the wall when I ran out of books. I read every book on the book cart. Then started getting books from Lucy Parsons' Books Through Bars program that supplied free books of all genres to prisoners statewide if you wrote them and asked them to. And then the loaf was dry and Shit was hard as hell, tasteless, but I bust that shit down every meal. I developed a sensitivity to light and had to get photo ray lenses with glasses and wear glasses because my light gave me serious migraine headaches now. And doctors started giving me multivitamins because I become vitamin deficient. They took my vitals twice a week. No time because this time until finally I was packed up and then sent back to Auburn again. And I got there during the lockdown because a dude named Nut stabbed the CO and the CO's killed him. Just straight beat him to death. People said he been dead, but they just kept beating him. They ran his head on the floor so much, the whole back of his head was missing or just came in. One of his eyeballs hung down his cheek from a bloody vein out the socket. Like Kevin Clark was here in C-Block, he got wrong doing ace over 100 years from when they allegedly shot from all of his loved ones. Later, they made a film about that shit, and um, it was full of lies. Kevin Clark was a rat, but people got tired of getting at him, and the man was dangerous. I just don't, I took an entry job, and I read the paperwork that was circling the jail, because Ron knew, you know, Ronald Bolden, and got a reversal on the case. Shit, him and his code defendant. And when they came to court, testified against him again, and got them 112 in life again. So like, this dude was like a double rat. And he said the back up north went over 100 years again. But after three months working in the industry, making furniture for office buildings, I was packed up and sent to Cayuga. That was a medium correct facility like not far from there, like down the cross street more from. My daughter's mother came to see me. It was a beautiful visit, but 
I told her how I mean, who, who was who was her sister's baby father, so also, also known as man on us in the ride. You know, we had that we had over and he didn't literally run, he just didn't come out come outside to the yard when it was time to put on for a month until all the smoke cleared and damn everybody left. Real coward shit. Told her mom, you know, my baby mother's mother, Barbara Ann, that I almost got him killed. I was like, hey, this is bitch, this nigga. And half the beef was over him because some of the money was here that this nigga Bruce was supposed to have bought some shit back for. So we really basically popped off for this dumb nigga and he never even came out to the yard. Anyway, I went to the yard one day. I met up with Danny Boy. That was my co defendant Sam's boy from town. Part of that Young Guns crew, you know, from Queens, and I was doing that Flash of Queens, Ty Ty from Grant. I was like, you know, after good work, I was dumb, I got back to our cube, and my brand new white on white uptown was missing. I seen the dude wearing them, looking tough. I ain't say a word. They had a laundry room, so I went in there, grabbed a handful of tied powder detergent, took the lock off my locker, put it in three socks, acting like I was just going to walk by the dude. But when I go, he was an easy six foot three, 250 pounds. Seemed like everybody was thinking of me back then. So I threw the detergent in his eyes and whipped his ass with that, that sock and that lock until police tackled me off him. I went to the box and, was just, and went right back to Auburn the next day. You know, they have 20, they have 72 hours to serve you a ticket and seven days to start the hearing. I never got the ticket or had a hearing, so after eight days, I was let off and let out myself. I want to go right back to the yard because dudes tried to jump Romeo Biz in the yard. So they called this dude Biz and Rashi. That's my boy. He was a cat with us, you know what I'm saying? In the yard. He's a real live Brooklyn dude. It's my boy, real comrade. Like, yeah, I know him since, like, forever. Anyway, the first day in the yard, you know, we throwing blows. He throwing blows right at this side. I'm throwing blows at this side. Blows at this side. Frank White leaped over, cut a dude named Lee Woods. That was real bad. Little who I ran over once they saw me. Then like the whole home court moved and it looked like a, a race right away. Most of us was just throwing joints. A few got stomped out, some got poked with ice bits, but overall it was basically basically cuffs. Everybody was throwing throwing their hands. So they shot the gas in the yard and um they got they got all of them got like 90 days key block. The majority of us got 90 days key block. And that's when the steel cage matches began and the key block cages. You know, Chuck, James, AK, Big Shot, came from nowhere. Everything he hit fell. He was like my big brother. He was a cat attack with me back in the day. But I didn't realize how many people, I didn't realize how many people I dragged into this by getting involved. But there's his family, and I know you can do it for me. You have one minute left. Everyone put it down for key block recreation. I was about to reach my conditional release date of seven years. I be released. My daughter's mom brought my little girl to see me on the regular now. My little girl, you know, when sure she see me, no matter what, she run full blast and leap into my arms, completely airborne, with full confidence, knowing I catch it. I miss that. I used to love that. I miss rec. Yeah, I used to miss that so much. But anyway, I missed the first recreation that first day in the caves because I had a good. And I really thank God I did, because Boogie Blind and Papa Stopper. Then they killed a few dudes in the cages, and, and Baby from the Bronx, you know, he's the leader and the founder of the Kanye who stabbed the dude up till his arm got tired. They was chasing dudes all up the fence. Dudes was getting caught up in the barbed wire fence and trying to get away from them. Cause you know, Blind, Papa Stopper, and Baby, they came out with, with big ass ice sticks, and it was real nasty. Yeah, I couldn't afford no weapons charges cause they would have took good time for me, and I maxed out. And my max was number three years, because I had three and 13. Now I remote, beat up so many people every day. Started the cops told him, yeah, I'd never fight. He called it the box instead of the key block. All of them was a boxing jail with a boxing program, so fights were respected mostly, but Lion Moe hurt people. You know, he was from Harlem, ex-military, he knew what he was doing. And he was a big boy. And I mean, Nine Mo was like, they call that nigga the heavy hitter, the heavy roller. That nigga had, he was like six foot three and just, nigga looked like one big ass muscle. But you know, Harold Conqueror, that was an old Jewish monster. He had about 45 years in at that time. Because he, 
he allegedly got knocked with a graveyard. You know, he never told nobody. That's how I know him anyway. And um, later on, I found out that he was like the oldest person in the state. Yeah, like 57, 58 years in before they let him go. And you know, he got home to his daughter from Florida. And it was really his daughter who sent the letter because so he couldn't even write no more. He was so old. And then he had passed. It was sad because, you know, Kill was good, man. He came to all my fights. Kill Smitty was, you know, John, John Smith. He was my corner man and trainer. So boxing kept me out of trouble until I went home. It was through Kevin Rooney who used to bring professional fighters in and, you know, test the medal against us. And he was punching through. But, you know, I was released in, like, May 1997. After Biggie died, I was sick about that. I went to my sister's house in the bar. My grandma moved to Georgia, and I was just waiting for my parole to transfer my grand transfer my, my parole to my grandmother's house. Two days before I went home, Stanley Davis came to see me with my sister. This is Wild Al's brother, and you know we got to really chop it up. And like she was on my mind the whole time. I couldn't wait to get out the gate. Those seven years it was like a billion years for me. And I swear to God, I want to go, man. I'm not never coming back. That was it. How long you lasted in? I lasted 40 days. I came home and was about 40 days. When I was home for 40 days, they, they, I went to parole. They arrested me for 13 homicides and four attempt murders. They said that I came home and went crazy. How could a man do all that in 40 days? And um, I went home with a mindset on vengeance, but my nigga, I didn't do all that. That's like too much, that's crazy. And um, I went home, when we get into the 21 year bed, I'm gonna express all that shit, how everything went down, the trial and all that. Who I was with, who okay, maybe my co defendants was, why certain things went down. And I got the facts on how I had to go to eight trials to 13 homicides and four attempts. I had to go to trial on the certain food. They just never came to court for They just the cases died down. But, it was nasty, nasty work. Like everything that happened in Harlem within them 40 days, they charged me for it. And police was calling me Hell's Last Demon. Like that's the nickname they gave me. They was like, yo, huh, so Hell's Last Demon is home. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, yeah, we know you did this, you did that. And I'm like, yo, listen. Mm -hmm. Boy, they was like, yo, you sure you don't want to tell us everything? I said, I'm telling you right now, lawyer. So when they start talking that homicide, this, I was like, Lord, man, and I ain't gonna hold you. I had a 180 day death notice. Where they had 180 days to decide whether they was gonna give me the death penalty or not. And um, all I still have is my grandmother. And that part in 40 days, I didn't even see my grandmother. All 40 days I was home because the world wouldn't give me, they wouldn't do my transfer fast enough. And they wouldn't give me a pass to go see her. I'm like, yo, this woman just did a whole seven years with me because let me go see my grandmother. Man. So I said, fuck that. And I, I went to I went to North Carolina to see my brother Chicken Law's wife, Raina, because she had a power on doing their whistle. So I went out there, all the motherfucking bugs, went hammers and everything, just to make sure his wife was good. Got out there, because the dude that took a Porsche, went to that nigga house, got everything that nigga had of hers back, took his daughter chain of shopping, make sure his wife was good. And, um, you have I, one minute left. After I got locked up, my man who I took out there with me, you know, he fell in love with Raina and they had kids. But they grown, I had nothing to do with that shit. But the whole thing is I went and took care of this nigga family before I even went to see my grandmother. And I don't understand to this day why my brother Chicken Rob just abandoned me and the family. Like, this nigga don't talk to me, write me, other guys that came to see me. Now, over 20 years, like, since why she died, this nigga, and I never did nothing to this nigga. This is my brother. He's supposed to be my big brother. Hey, yo, make sure you check out that other episode, Shiz Wars in Southport with Sha Sha. You heard? That's fire. Z Man Suicide Polo with the Ski Man, the kid with the slave shackle tats. 
I be forgetting. I be forgetting to push my tats and show my tats. My tag game different. You heard? Different. Get at me for them collabs. Get at me if you need that promo. If you love what I'm doing, you already know. Feel free to hit that slash app up. You heard? Z Lord. <laughs>